thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part two of the authentic and complete history of the ancient and mystical order Rosicrucius compiled by H. Spencer Lewis, FRC, Grand Master General and Imperator of the Order in the United States. Taken from the American Rosicrucius, a magazine of life's mysteries, January 1916, Volume 1, Number 1. The Origin of the Order. The Order had its conception and birth in Egypt. In giving the facts of the origin, the writer realizes that to an exceptional degree will exactness and authoritativeness be demanded by the reader and in consequence pardon must be granted for reiteration. Time and space will not be used in describing conditions in Egypt as they existed at the time of the conception of so wonderful an organization as this. The reader is requested to read either a brief or extended history of Egypt, which will prove highly illuminating on this subject. One will find, however, that the Egyptians had reached a high state of civilization and advanced learning at the beginning of the 18th dynasty, comparable only with the Renaissance of France. Many were the means adopted to preserve the knowledge attained that it might be correctly given to future generations. The hieroglyphic markings of the pyramids, obelisk, and temple walls give us evidence of the first desires to make permanent the knowledge and learning of the Egyptians. For instance, Alexander the Great found in the Great Pyramid of Giza the Emerald Tablet. This famous tablet was engraved with a diamond by the great Hermes and contained the secret Hermetic and Rosicrucian secrets of alchemy. It was originally hidden in the tombs of Hermes by the Rosicrucians to preserve for future generations the knowledge they possessed. But the more profound secrets of nature, science and art, were not to be entrusted to the masses, nor were they susceptible to preservation through writing upon papyra. For this reason, classes were formed by the most learned, attended by the select minds at which the doctrines and principles of science were taught. These classes or schools, as history refers to them, were held in the most isolated grottos at the time and again in the quiet of some of the temples erected to the many Egyptian gods. In some cases, classes of very select nature were held in private chambers of the reigning pharaoh. The members of such assemblages became more and more select, the teachings more profound, and the discussions so dialectic that there arose a most autocratic and secret society of the true great minds of the day. Thus, the first pharaoh who conducted the class in his private chambers was almost the first, who reigned from 1580 BC to 1550 BC. Because he was capable of conducting the great school as well as ruling the people upon a more civilized and advanced principle, due to his training in the school, no doubt. He is referred to as the deliverer of Egypt by some historians. He was succeeded as Pharaoh by Amenhotep I, who reigned 10 years and became a teacher in the secret school for three years. On January 12th, approximately 1538 BC, Thotmos I was crowned succeeding Amenhotep I. He owed his position to his wife, Amos, who was the first woman to become a member of the class on equal terms with the men. The discussion regarding her admittance, still preserved in the Rosicrucian archives, forms an interesting document and reveals the origin 
of some of the doctrines of the equality of the sexes. Thutmose I was succeeded by Hatshepsut, his daughter, who ruled as a king independently and co-regent with her half-brother Thutmose III, a son of Thutmose I by his marriage to Isis. It was Thutmose III who organized the present physical form of the Rosicrucian order and outlined many of its rules and regulations. He became a ruler upon the disposition of his father, Thutmose I, in 1500 BC. He ruled until 1447 BC, and his reign is unimportant to us, except for his establishment of the order. He appears to have been quite original in his application of the doctrines of Rosicrucianism, but held to the existing external form of religion, possibly because of political conditions. Egypt was not free from the danger of the grasping hand of adjoining nations and the life of his rulership was constantly tormented by outbreaks of war and the cooperation of his military forces depended considerably upon permitting the populace to indulge in all its fanciful beliefs, the idolatrous religions especially. For this reason, an immediate change in the foundations of their religion such as was made by Thutmose's descendant, Amenhotep IV, in 1355, with such reactionary results, did not seem advisable or even necessary. A gradual development in the existing beliefs could be more easily and permanently accomplished by establishing a school of philosophy, the students at which would put into practice the high standards decided upon. As in all ages, there were then those who might be called advanced thinkers, true philosophers, sages, and scholars. Many of these were students of the Rosicrucian doctrines as taught by Thutmose's predecessors, and they evidently had great faith in the final success of the principles. For when Thutmose proposed that the class which had been meeting in his chambers become a closed and secret order, there were no descending voice and articles of limitations were established ere the assembly dispersed in the early hours of the dawn. This grand council meeting, for such it is considered in all official records, occurred during what would be called the week of March 28th to April 4th of 1489 BC, according to our present calendar. It is generally considered to have been on Thursday, April 1st, but this may be associated with Monday, Thursday, a later establishment. However, Thursday has become the usual day for Rosicrucian meetings, and Monday, Thursday has become the occasion for special temple services throughout all AMORC lodges of the world. Twelve brothers and sisters were present at this first Supreme RC Council of the World, the sisters being the wife of Thutmose III, known in the order as Mini, the wife of one of the brothers, and another who was a descendant of one of the rulers of a presiding destiny. Therefore, there were nine brothers and three sisters at this council, a combination of numbers very significant. No name was decided upon for the order, the record showing that the predominating thought was the maintenance of secrecy. The order was to have no publicity, required no propaganda other than personal advice to those whose presence in the order was desired. And as the one word translated into order, a secret fraternal body, was sufficient name for all purposes, we do not find any other term. This accounts for the widespread division of the name as adopted later. In so many of the documents issued by the Supreme Magus to the Grand Lodges throughout the world, the name of the order is seldom mentioned. 
The writer has noticed this especially in such documents as are given to a newly established Grand Lodge and which are translations of the documents prepared prior to 1326 BC. In these, the element, the ideal of secrecy is so strong and predominant that the order is referred to indirectly and sometimes erroneously or perhaps diplomatically as it, the school, the brotherhood, and the council. Furthermore, many of these documents begin with the announcement, I, Brotherhood of the Illuminati, with power decreed to declare this manifesto, or with the salutation, I, F, Illuminati of the Twelve, meaning I, Frater Illuminati of the Twelfth Degree. Very often, these official manifestos are signed with Peace Profound and sometimes F Profundus or F12. These words not only show that the Twelfth or Last Degree was the last order within the order known as the Illuminati, even to this day, but they also explain why some references are made to these documents as instructions of the Illuminati, which may easily be misinterpreted or carelessly interpreted as instructions to the Illuminati, as one sees them referenced to works published abroad in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries AD, where the Order of Rosa Crucis is designed solely by the term Illuminati. Furthermore, if one considers for a moment the prejudice or even the prohibition against such secret orders as the AMORC represented, one will appreciate the very evident attempts at subterfuge. Not only did certain religious organizations condemn all secret organizations as works of the devil, but those orders or bodies which claim to have rare knowledge of the sciences were severely criticized by the various open scientific bodies of the day. As soon as learning became very general and competition arose between schools and students, the secret societies were widely condemned, even though many of the most unfair critics of some were oath-bound members of others. However, Without definite name, Thutmus saw that the order had very definite principles, rules and modes of procedure, all of which have came down to us today without material change. At the close of his reign in 1447, there were 39 brothers and sisters in the order, and the meetings which had become regular and systematic were held in one of the halls of the Temple of Karnak, outside of which Thutmose the third erected two obelisks bearing a record of his achievements. Thutmose signed most of the decrees of the council with his own cartouche and it became the seal of the order. A testimony to the great work of our teacher or master to be forever a mark of honor and loyalty. As was customary with these rulers when any event of national importance occurred, Thutmose issued a scarab bearing his cartouche on one side, plus a mark which has a special meaning to all Rosicrucians. This original scarab, which was used for hundreds of years in Egypt by various AMORC councils to impress the seal of the order in wax to all official documents was given to the Grand Lodge of America along with other jewels and papers of an official nature and is considered one of the rarest antiquities of Egypt now in this country. The order here is to be congratulated on having in its possession perhaps the oldest if not the most sacred of all Rosicrucian jewels, one which has never been used by others than the supreme masters at Egypt, for it means virtually the passing of the master spirit from Egypt to America, as was planned by the founders centuries ago. This seal appears on the stationary and official documents of the order in America along with the American RC seal, 
and its illegitimate use constitutes a forgery according to the bylaws of the order throughout the world, punishable by a special decree of the masters. Of all the so-called Rosicrucian movements in America, none has ever dared to use this seal and certainly none ever will use it without the permission of the Grand Lodge of America. In this connection, it may be explained that the obelisk in Central Park, one of the two erected in Egypt by Thutmus III and intended to stand someday in the country where the eagle spreads its wings, bears the cartouche or the seal of the order as well as many other authentic and instructive Rosicrucian signs. Before his transition, Thutmus III made his son by Hatshetsu co-regent. Thus, Amenhotep II took up his father's work in the order. About the end of September 1448, in the month of March, the 17th to be exact, 1447 BC, Thutmus passed to the great beyond, having been king for nearly 54 years and being but one week less than 89 years of age. His mummy was found in the cachette at Daryl El Burry, and history claims him the greatest pharaoh in the new empire, if not in all Egyptian history. Amenhotep II ruled from 1448 to 1420 BC, and he in turn was succeeded by his son, Thutmose the Fourth who ruled from 1420 to 1411 BC. Amenhotep III, son of the preceding, occupied the throne from 1411 to 1375 BC and was the last of the truly powerful pharaohs or empires. Upon the transition of Amenhotep III, the empire fell to his son, Amenhotep IV with whose history all Rosicrucians are greatly concerned. He was the last Grand Master in the family of the Founders, and the one to whom we owe the really wonderful philosophies and writings used so universally in all large work throughout the world. Amenhotep IV was born in the Royal Palace at Thebes, November the 24th, 1378 BC. His mother, Tai, Ortia was of humble birth, but he and his father paid the most sincere respects to her and were ever proud of designating her Queen Tia upon all monuments. He was only 11 years old in 1367 BC when he was crowned and immediately began a career unequaled by any pharaoh of Egypt. It is claimed in official records that Amenhotep was a prodigy as a result of a special course of prenatal influence adopted by his mother for the very purpose of bringing into the world a holy inspired learned man. In this respect, his looked for birth as the coming of a great leader of God's chosen people furnishes another precedent for the beliefs of later nations and peoples that in times of great crises a leader would be sent by God. Also how this incident furnished a feeling in all Rosicrucians that a great Rosicrucian leader will be born into the order in each decade and in each nation where such a leader is required. His father, having been the master of the order for a number of years, built the great temple of Luxor and dedicated it to the order. He also added to the temple of Karnak and in many ways left monuments of testimony and praise. The order numbered 283 brothers and 62 sisters at this time. And at the time of the crowning of the young Amenhotep IV, the master of the order was one Thihopset who remained in the office until 1365 BC. Amenhotep's installation as master by council decree occurred in the temple of Luxor, April 9, 
1365 at sunset in the presence of his bride and her parents. Amenhotep being the only descendant, it was deemed advisable that he marry as early as the customs then permitted in order that an heir to the throne would be assured. But Amenhotep had a number of children. Unfortunately, they were daughters. And this proved disastrous to the order as well as to the throne. It may be permissible here to contribute a few facts to the history of Egypt more especially to this ruler's life and thereby settle with authority from the RC archives this doubt regarding Amenhotep the Force's children. There has always been considerable concern felt by historians because Amenhotep did not leave more accurate data regarding his family. In this, as other instances of Egyptian history, the RC archives are exact and illuminating. Amenhotep's wife was Nefertim. His daughters were named as followed. The life of this great man is too easily found in various histories of Egypt, especially Braestids. To warrant space in this work, but his accomplishments for the order must be treated at least briefly. Rosicrucianism is not given to any belief in the special or unusual divinity of any man. It recognizes in the man Jesus only the same qualities, physical and spiritual, to be found in every other man, although it does recognize his superior mental abilities as evidenced by his teachings of the Rosicrucian philosophy and doctrines. But we do feel, perhaps as a result of our great pride, honor, and respect, that Amahotep, the fourth, our last foundation master, was unusually inspired with the laws of the divine principles and that unto him was revealed the great truth. Born in a country whose people were given to idolatry, where the chief endeavors were those of building temples to gods of all kinds, It is easy to appreciate his attitude towards the existing religion or religions after he had been thoroughly instructed in the Rosicrucian philosophy. His mind and understanding were unusually keen, for in his 15th year he composed many of the most beautiful prayers, psalms, and chants used in the order today as well as contributed to the philosophy and sciences. But to him came the inspiration of overthrowing the worship of idols, and substituting the religion and worship of one God, a supreme deity, whose spirit was in heaven and whose physical manifestation was the sun, the symbol of life. This was in accordance with the Rosicrucian doctrines, and it changed the worship of the sun as a god to the worship of the god as symbolized by the sun. This was the beginning of monotheism in Egypt and the origin of the worship of a spiritual deity which existed everywhere in everything but was nothing of the earth, i.e. had no physical existence on the earth in the form of inanimate or non-spiritual images. Author E.P. Wagle, Chief Inspector of the Department of Antiquities, Upper Egypt, in writing of the religion inspired by Amenhotep IV says, like a flash of blinding light in the nighttime, the Aton, which is the sun symbol of the deity, stands out for a moment amidst the black Egyptian darkness and disappears once more, the first signal to the world of the future religions of the West. One might believe that Almighty God had for a moment revealed himself to Egypt. Truly, the religion of Amenhotep did not endure for long. Compared to the years of darkness, it was but a flash, for it died as a public and general religion when Amenhotep passed beyond the veil in 1350 BC. He too left many monuments to the glory of the order, First, he removed as far as possible all pillars of Amun 
and all references to Amun as a god. So thorough was his work that he did not hesitate to mutilate the work done by his father at Karnak and Luxor by effacing all references to the god Amun, even to removing the name of his father and mother where they were connected with such idolatry. This naturally provoked the populace, especially since Amenhotep substituted beautiful monuments to the living god. At Karnak, for instance, he built an RC temple, which to be dedicated to Rei Horatik, which means to the life beat, which is in Aton, the sun. The ruins of the temple may be seen today, and the word Horatik is significant to all Rosicrucians. It was on tablets erected by Amenhotep at this temple that the sun symbols, as now used in the order, were first designed and adopted. In the fifth year of his reign, when only 16 years of age, a sweeping reform was initiated throughout Egypt by his decree, which prohibited any other form of worship except that already mentioned. In one of his decrees, he wrote, This is an oath of truth, which it is my desire to pronounce and of which I will not say, it is false, eternally, forever. He then changed his own name so that it would not be inconsistent with his reform. Amenhotep meant Amen is satisfied. This he altered to Akhenaten or Ignaten, meaning pious to Aton or glory to Aton. The word or term Aton was adopted by Amenhotep to mean the exact equivalent of Lord. The same as Shekinah in the Jewish temples represented or expressed the present or spirit of God. It is a strange coincidence that, although Shekinah was adopted by the Jews and is still used by them in very orthodox services, it was adopted also by Rosicrucians in Egypt many years previously and is referred to in the present day first degree initiations in the order. He built a new capital at El Amarna in the plains of Herm Opolis, a virgin site at the edge of the desert, and abandoned Thebes because it was the magnificent city of Ammon. At El Amarna, he also built a large temple for the order. In the form of a cross and a large number of houses for his council of the order. Here was the beginning of the monastic life, for within the boundaries of El Amarna lived 296 brothers of the order, each having taken an oath never to pass beyond the shadow of the temple. El Amarna is situated about 160 miles above modern Cairo along the Nile. Here was a bay protected on the west side by the river, in which lies a small island. As Amenhotep viewed the scene from his boat on the Nile, he is quoted as saying, on the island shall be pleasure houses and pavilions. On the main land along the river, where is the strip of cultivated land, I shall place my palaces, rose gardens of my nobles. Beyond these, in the plains of the sand, I shall erect the temples and palaces, and further on, where the limestone cliffs in crescent shape enclose the city, I shall have the chariot drives, roads, and tombs. And so it was. Even today, the once famous chariot drives, tombs, temples, and palaces in ruins may be seen. These brothers wore special costumes, which included a cord at the loins and a covering for the head, while the priest in the temple wore a surplus of linen and had his head shaved in a round spot on the top. It was from this institution that all monastic orders, especially that of St. Francis, derived their methods, even their customs. During these years at El Armana, 
the AMORC was being made into a concrete organization and the brothers at this community outlined the initiations and forms of service as used today in every lodge of the order. Agnaten or Amenhotep IV not only built his temple in the form of a cross, but he added the cross and the rose as symbols of the order and further adopted the Crux Azata in a special coloring as the symbol to be worn by all teachers or masters in the lodge. In fact, the last year of his life was spent in evolving a wonderful system of symbols used to this day. To express every phrase and meaning of the Rosicrucian sciences, arts, and philosophies. And while some of these have become known to the uninitiated through the researches of Egyptologists, many remain secret to the order and all are understandable only to the initiated. Here was given birth to many of the most interesting symbols used in our order. Amenhotep was passionately fond of his Persian rose garden and wandered in it daily for study and inspiration. His tribute to the rose, undoubtedly inspired by his close study of the unfoldment of his roses, is a masterpiece of admiration for the beauties of nature. Incidentally, it contains many significant remarks, easily interpreted as a prophecy of later discoveries in botany. It was his great love for the rose and its resemblance to the human soul in the process of evolution that made him adopt it as an RC symbol. It may interest Masons to know that when the cornerstone of the temple here was laid by Amenhotep with due ceremony, year zero, fourth month of the second season, day 132, the three of Freemasonry was used and that when Amenhotep was laid in his last resting place in the tomb, his face was covered with a gold vulture with wings outstretched. Many hundreds of years later, when his body was recovered, this was found to be true by the eminent Egyptologist and English expeditions, just as our records had always recorded. Perhaps Freemasons will recognize the meaning, then and the origin, of the vulture with outstretched wings and some of their symbols, especially in connection with the rose croix in their 18th degree, adopted so many hundreds of years later. As a ruler, our master felt utterly to check the desire for war, and by his attacks on the popular religion, he left the way open for invasion through the lack of cooperation on the part of his subjects. As the crisis approached, our master foresaw the results and sad at his neglect of political matters. In his enthusiasm for the spiritual, he weakened his health, which seems to have been below normal. And he was finally forced to take his bed in the month of July, 1350 BC. Instead of using his mighty knowledge to regain his health, it appears from his last dictated writings that his constant wish was to be spiritualized, that he might be raised up to that plane from which God's symbol shone down upon him. He fasted, practically starving himself, refused the services of the physicians in the order and prayed constantly. Then, on July the 24th, late in the afternoon, while he lay with his right hand upstretched to God pleading be taken into the Noahs. He was seen by his brothers and sisters of the order watching there to be actually raised from his bed for a moment and then to drop back in sweet repose with a smile of illumination upon his countenance. Thusly, passed to the beyond, our great master who did so much and left so much for our order. He may have neglected Egypt politically but she will always remember her young pharaoh whose 28 years left its arts and architecture, its sciences and philosophies so greatly changed and improved. His reign was like unto the renaissance of France and even the hieroglyphics and art 
show a vast improvement based upon the principles of truth. At the time of his crowning, he took the title of Amenhotep, King Living in Truth, which was the Rosicrucian phrase of fidelity as it is today, and he passed onward to the other life in truth. Perhaps the most summary of all testimonies to Amenhotep IV from outside of the Rosicrucian literature is that paid by James Preston, professor of Egyptology, University of Chicago, who says in his history of Egypt, the modern world has yet adequately to value or even acquaint itself with this man, who in an age so remote and under conditions so adverse became the world's first individual. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider giving to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you very much.